Hey, it's part of the Scotch Test Dummies. Come to you with my top 10 whiskeys to try before you die. Very morbid. Very morbid. You, who knows when you're going to die? You might need to do this whole binge thing one weekend. Just get them out of the way and you can say, hey, I'm ready. Bucket list is done. <laughs> so here's the deal. None of these are over 25 years. You should be able to get all of them or you'll see in one caveat a category or type thereof. What is that? Um, uh, and I, I will tell you some of these are kind of in my favorites and some of them are a lot of them. There's more about what I think of whiskey as and I think of it as an experience, as a quest, as a journey. So you probably wouldn't be watching this if you are a Jameson guy. That's all I drink. I don't drink anything else. And it's just the regular Jameson. That's what my daddy drank. That's what my granddaddy drank. That's what I drink. I don't even try nothing else. Tribalism's out here. Tribalism's out. This is all about an experience. So this is what this is going to be. So if we're speaking experience, we need white dog or white lightning or light whiskey or whatever you want or uh, poutine. I always say it wrong. Poutine, poutine, who knows? See, I even poutine. I think I got it right. So what I'm showing here, not necessarily the ones you got to get, but we got the Buffalo Trace White Dog Mash number one. And this is the, oh boy. Well, I'll say it all wrong. It's, it's, it's Irish. I will tell you, having tried White Dog, um, it educated my palate. So you're saying, why are you saying to start on that? Well, I'm presuming if you're watching this, you've probably at least had a couple whiskeys in your lifetime. By trying some White Dog, and I'll even tell you, I thought the Buffalo Trace one was really, really good. Um, by trying it, you pick up the youth that comes from not being the rawness from not being in a barrel and figure out, oh, that's what a barrel does. Oh, it's in a barrel longer. Or, hey, that one seems pretty young because I'm picking up some of that white dog in the dram. Um, and you get um, that essence of what the whiskey is. And let's be clear, for years and years and, and years, a lot of people did not age their whiskey in a barrel. So, do I drink White Dog for fun? No. But this is about an experience. Try it before you die because what it will help your palate do is pick up youth and other barrel-aged whiskeys that you try. That is my number 10. So my number 10 is a generic White Dog or a White Lightning. Um, still a, uh, still a, a malt, all right? Um, but give it a shot. And we're going to jump from that into crazy town. <laughs> Some of you will have expected this, so I wanted to get it in and get it out of the way early. Elijah Craig, single barrel, not single barrel, small batch, barrel proof. No single barrels in here. You can go get this. This comes out three times a year in an A, B, and C version. This is my number nine. Now, again, this list isn't saying that, oh, this is not my favorite. This is me just kind of, kind of arbitrarily putting them into a tin. But... I wanted this to follow that white dog because this is the bourbon that made me recognize bourbon for my own palate um, in a more definitive way. I um, was not, I wasn't against bourbon, but it, was, it seemed kind of samey coming from that virgin oak barrel. And I was always getting the caramels and maybe a little bit of cinnamon in this one, a little bit of vanilla in this one. But the quintessential bourbon notes, a little bit more oak, a little bit less, a little bit of rye in the mash bill, uh, some wheat in the mash bill. But when Scott said, come over and try this, we made a beautiful steak, we tried this. It literally, we call it the barrel or the bottle of wow, because when I sipped it, not only is it high proof, which is going to get your attention, but it is so rich in flavor. I think I uttered wow five times before I said anything else. So by following the white dog, the reason for this placement is to then show you the depth that you can get from a barrel aged spirit. 
um, from a quality crafted barrel aged spirit. It's so rich. Um, it's, it's so like comforting that it became my favorite bourbon. It still is now. And it re-energized the whole bourbon category for me. So Elijah Craig Barrel Proof for what we call the bottle of wow. So number three, we're going to step out of the bourbons and go to a rye, Pikesville rye. So Pikesville, um, this is a straight rye whiskey. Um, I was leaning toward rye um, because they're more peppery and sparky and in your face. They'll slap you around a little bit. Now that can be off-putting to some people as well, but again, it's worth reaching out, giving it a try, because it'll help you do a couple things. It'll help you pick up rye, a, a bourbon that's got a higher rye mash bill. Um, and there are times when what I want is something that's just going to be like a, like a thunderstorm in your mouth. <laughs> okay. That's rye for me. It's, it's just... It's harder to make, you know, it gets all kind of gummy up and there's and and there's and all the equipment when they're making it, but it's just this this raw punch when you have it. And it makes you stand up and pay attention. And I also find the Pikesville in particular to be very, very smooth. We did blind tasting, we love blind tasting on this show. And for me, the Pikesville rose above the other 15. We did 16 of them blind, and I just just really like the sweetness, the smoothness, the, the peppery punches that are in there, the cinnamons. Um, so it's just a, a, it's like a flavorful party and unique, robust, powerful. It's my number eight was Pikesville. So my number seven is going to continue down the American road, but with a little hint of, not a hint, but a a large Scottish influence. So McCarthy's is from Clear Creek Distillery, um, and it's a pot distilled uh, single malt whiskey where the malted peated barley, Scottish barley, it's all sourced from Scotland. And it has a very distinct Isla peated whiskey flavor. So you're saying peated whiskey. If you tried a scotch and it was like an ashtray and you hated it, you and I have something in common from when I first tried peated whiskey. I hated it. I was like, this is like licking an ashtray. What the hell? What the hell? Take that away. It even smells offensive. Okay. First of all, this is going to be a little more subtle entry into that peat experience. That's why I placed it here. I also place it here because I'm a huge fan of American single malts. And the idea, uh, I, I think it should be its own American category. Bourbon's got legal rules. I think there should be a, an American single malt. If folks don't want to follow whatever that make-believe law that I want would be, they can still go do their own thing. This one's called an organ. I want to say an organ single malt. Uh, Portland, Oregon. I don't know. It just says pot distilled whiskey. Yeah, Oregon single malt. McCarthy's Oregon single malt. Um, this one might be a little harder to find, um, but I wanted to put it on there for the reason that I love the fact that they source that, that peated Scottish barley and then what they're doing with it. Um, so American single malts or Oregon single malts and the first foray into peat. You'll see some more peat in the future. So this is again my number seven. All right, my number six, same West Coast, American, Westland, American single malt. So they've actually uh, used barley from Washington State for their Westland American single malt. I picked this as my number six because it again is part of the the journey and I find it extremely exciting that this American single malt is still evolving and developing. 
Um, so if you haven't tried an American single malt, or whatever they kind of want to call it, an Oregon single malt in terms of McCarthy's, um, reach out and give them a shot. What you'll get here is it's, it's like a touchstone to that Scottish barley, whereas you can pick up the malted barley, but it's totally and uniquely different. It's as different as regions in Scotland make Scotch different. And that is why I'm excited about this idea of an American single malt. I like malted barley. I like having a single malt drain. Um, I, I lean toward Scotch for that reason. But I love what's happening and what I'm starting to see as American regions for single malts. You're going to see several of those pop up in this list and I believe there's going to be a whole explosion of experiences and different kinds of whiskeys and even regions that are developing and I keep saying regions because you may see what I consider kind of a region coming up in the future but number six Westlands American single malt barley grown and used from Washington State. Smooth, uh, clean, unique. All right, my number five is available. I've had two bottles, knocked through them both, recycled those bottles, went to search around a few liquor stores because I see it every once in a while, but I couldn't find it in Wichita, Kansas. But Corsair's Oat Rage is available all right, you can find it. It's running, I saw, between $47 and $69, and you can even get it from some places shipped to you if your state allows. Since I could not find even, uh, I recycled my empty bottle, I did go out and buy the Grainiac, which has nine different grains in it, one of which is oat. But I'm going to turn it back from the Grainiac back to this side because we're going to talk about oat rage. As you may have guessed, it uses oat as its fermented grain. I first purchased this uh, at a local liquor store because they had it on their clearance rack. Nobody would buy it. <laughs> I thought, well, give it a shot. I love what Corsair does with their triple smoke and their uh, Rymageddon. Um, the Grainiac is good. Let's give this a shot. Here's the weird thing. I did not like it at first. And you will find that with certain whiskeys as you move through, even in particular my list. Sometimes right after you open them, it, it's not, I mean, it's not bad, but if you drink a little down and then cork it and come back, sometimes a few weeks, a few days, sometimes a few months, sometimes you're surprised and outraged surprised the hell out of me. Outrage gives me a lot of chocolates, cocoa type chocolates, not a milk chocolate, but that, that cocoa. And it is, it, it was so cocoa distinct that I would look and sometimes go, what do I want? Yes, tonight I want something with that cocoa whiskey going on. That sounds weird to me, even as I say it, but it was smooth and creamy, heavier, like cocoa dark chocolate notes, that it was a flavor, almost like how foodies get excited about the little twists that they'll get in, in certain kinds of food. And it was so completely unique that I found another one. And, and what was interesting with that was, when I opened it again, at first I was like, oh, this one, f oh no, it's totally different. And then the same thing happened. It, it opened up more into those cocoa notes after it had had some oxygen reach it. So, before you die, find some Corsair Oat Rage. All right. Um, uh, when I was in Nashville, Tennessee, I actually toured. They have two distilleries right there in Tennessee. I toured Nashville's and tried tried a bunch of different things there. They are a small distillery, but you can get this, and it's definitely worth trying as long as you're not turned off by 
cocoa. But again, this is all about a quest, a journey through whiskey, stepping away from the same into things that are different and expanding your palate. At least that's what my list is about. So number five is the Corsair Oat Rage. They've got the same cool label with these like guys that are uh, that are walking down the street. I like their label. Just ignore the Grainiac. Find Oat Rage. Oat Rage. Number five. All right. Number four, Balcones Mirador. So we're going to say a couple things uh, about this, why this is on my list and at number four. So Balcones is out of Texas. I want to say Waco area, but either way, Texas. Texas and where they're at gets so hot that things age fast. And a lot of Balcones whiskey is what I say is, to me, very region-esque. So you're thinking Speyside or Isla or whatever over in Scotland. I get a sagebrush kind of flavor, smoked sagebrushy things from, from Texas whiskeys, from Balcones whiskeys. But they did something different with Mirador that makes it even more interesting. They used a second fill barrels for this. So it's not that virgin oak, and that um, allows them to leave them in the barrel longer without over oaking it or, you know, I, I've, you gotta be careful in that heat. I wanna pour some of this, that's how much I like this. Um, their Mirador kind of breaks from even the Texas sagebrush um, tradition, which is why it's very interesting that by taking that second fill barrel and putting their whiskey in there to age, that it allowed it to pick up some more complexity. Uh, even the nose is a little bit different. A lot of times on Balcones, I will get these uh, sagebrush um, notes and I get a lot more, um, even some cherries, sweetness here. Ooh, it's making me salivate. Mm. So, this is in line with my entire list because not only is it adventurous just as a region, Texas, and they're putting out in general the, the state of Texas phenomenal whiskeys from multiple different companies. Balcones is really reaching out, doing a lot of different things. I've got a rye back there. Uh, I've got um, uh, blue corns that they're using. Uh, they do some single malts and some single casts. Not some, a lot. Um, but this uh, single malt, Texas single malt whiskey pot distilled Mirador um, has brought a soft distinction to what they're doing. I get like, almost like a, a port or some kind of wine finish flavors from it. And it reminds me a lot of subtleties I'll get from scotches that I try. So as far as that, it's, it's unique and distinct and from Texas. <laughs> it's from Texas, come on. Do they have a star in there? They gotta have a star in there. They got a big X. <laughs> Let me take another sip, and then we're going to move into Scotland. With my number three, we're talking Craganmore, but it's not the standard Craganmore. This is the Distiller's Edition Double Matured. So what they've done is a cask finishing, a port cask finishing. Be this is on the list for two reasons. One delicious and it and it brings in this experience of finishing something um, in something else in this case it's got that port that port cask finishing in there I've got to pour a little bit of this too but it's on here for another reason too the very first scotch tasting that I was at this was my favorite and it spoke to me as a novice whiskey drinker, uh, the sweetness from the port that's in there, the complexities that are that are sliding around in this Crag and More. 
It's so approachable, flavorful, and, and light and, and refreshing all at the same time. When I had this at the tasting, I believe there was there were eight bottles there. I was thinking, oh, whiskey's not for me, especially scotch. And and I'd had an ashtray Isla. And I was like, oh, what the heck? Then I came across this. And I was like, ooh, ooh, hello. The nose is delicate, holds sweetness in there. I even get maybe some hints of cherries, but almost like a little bit of cream at the same time and a clean crispness. It's got to be lighter ABV. I haven't even looked. Yeah, 40%. So you can know that coming in, but I think that's part of the approachableness as well. But because of the, the pork cask finishing, it adds in some interesting and complex little variances that are in there. So, before you die, you got to try the Crag and Moore Distillers Edition with the port finishing. Double maturation, baby. This is the first time I'd had anything that had that double maturation alchemy going on. Number three. So you've seen the whiskey I like the most from my first tasting, and I've told you why. But I told you there was a peated one in there that was ashtray and I hated it. I was like, ugh, well, I don't hate peat anymore. So I'm going to bring it on and then I'm going to talk about it and peat in general. So it was the Lagavulin 16. Now a lot of folks that watch the show, you may be new to the show, but over the years they've seen that I've turned into a peat head. But my first experience was exactly what I told you and it was with the Lagavulin 16. I now find this, it's still very strong in the peat, but I find it milder than many others that I love as well. I'm bringing up the peat because a lot of people don't like it. I'm telling you, I didn't like it at first myself. And it's weird to say, oh, it's an acquired taste. Or, oh, if, if you only knew the beauties of it. I'm not doing any of that. What I'm telling you is, again, on this list, it's a try before you die, which means it's an experiential thing. My caveat here is, I wouldn't dive into the deep end first. Um, I hated it the first time I tried it. And then as I had more whiskey and tried different styles and types, um, it was a whole different branded whiskey that was a little lighter than this that was like, ooh, suddenly... This is hitting a part of my palate I enjoy. I enjoy in particular with this and other peats, the tobaccos. But here's some of the weird things you're going to get. I don't smoke. I don't like smoke. I used to wear contacts all the time and smoke irritated the heck out of me. I was a pain in the ass around smoke. I don't like ashtrays. Not this one, but some peats. Whiskies from Scotland, from Isla, taste like an ashtray. How in the hell is that good? It is, after a while. So don't rush out and try peat right away if you've never had any whiskey at all. If you've never had any scotch whiskey at all, I would tell you don't start with a peated, heavily peated whiskey. You want to tiptoe in and, and try, you know, some other whiskies. I almost had a Talisker on my list because I think those are extremely approachable. But I wanted to dive in deep because it's a list, try before you die. The, you'll, you'll get even touches of iodine here with this. And again, you're kind of like, huh? Well, it's a touch of iodine, but at the same time, it's got like a sweet plum or raisin and um, brown sugar kind of rolled around in there. So what you get are these very unique, as far as a dram will go, 
experiences both from the scent and the palate. But you got to know what you're headed into before you you go, in my opinion, which is why I put this near the end. Number two. Hmm. Oh, yeah. So with this, I get some fireside smoke pipe tobacco. The oak is, is kind of laid in there as well, but not too heavy. It's a little astringent, meaning dry. But I get touches of chocolate as well. And what was really odd as I came into peated whiskey more was the tobacco, and sometimes it's not like a burning cigarette tobacco, it's more like a pipe tobacco, would kick in these memories, which is bizarre because it's doing it now, of my grandfather's when he, my grandfather had smoked cigarettes, but I was too little to remember that. He had transitioned to a pipe trying to wean himself off because pipes are troublesome and keep them lit and everything. But I remembered him smoking like a sweet tobacco in a pipe. Well, here's what's weird. I didn't necessarily remember that. And then I had some and this memory, I must have been like three or four, flies back in. So it's flying back in now. It, it took whiskey experiences to another level because it was no longer just the juice or just what I was smelling or tasting. It was interacting with these very old memories. And as you experience whiskey or as you try different whiskeys and explore, some will hit you flat. Some you may not like. You may not like peated whiskey at all, but some you may run across and it will, it will ignite a sensory memory and it will take you there. And I guarantee you that when that happens, you will go, huh, there's not, well, the sense of smell, and sometimes this will sound weird, but especially with peated whiskey, I feel like I'm tasting smell. I know it sounds trippy. Trust me, there's no acid or mushrooms anywhere around here. But when it takes you into your own memory and like unlocks it and then you're enjoying the quality product all at the same time and the physical here and now sensation and it's triggering 44 years ago or whatever then it's something totally different and i'm not saying that happens all the time um, but i never find that with wine or beer i find that all the time with whiskey. Um, and it's not rocking them back in a shot. It's sitting down and spending time with the dram and then having it transport you somewhere. Boom. So I spent a lot of time on my number two, but Lagavulin 16 was something I hated when I first tried it. And now it will always be on my shelf. Um, it's a standby. It's got a memory that jogs things to this day. But let's go to my number one. Numero uno, number one whiskey. Again, this is just my list. I've had whiskeys that are better. Yeah, but this is pretty darn close. Ardbeg. It's another Isla whiskey. It's smoky. It's ashy. It's strong. It's also always there. It's like a good buddy. It's like Scott. <laughs> I can call him up and say, hey, short project. You want to help me paint the ceiling in the garage? I want a little bit more uniform color. How long do you think it'll take? A couple hours. He's there all day. Only complains a little bit. <laughs> I misjudge projects all the time. He'll tell you. So I've already kind of brought you along with what peat smoke can be as far as offensive. It can. It can hit you as medicine. It can hit you as 
antiseptic or ashtray. And you're not wrong with any of those. So again, it's number one, partially so that it's at the end of my list. Because I wouldn't tell you, oh, you've never had scotch? Try this right off the bat. Um, but you got to try it before you die. Even if you end up going, mm -mm, nope. And then I would tell you, come back every once in a while. You will be surprised how your palate will grow and change. Part of this journey that the Scotch Test Dummies are on, this quest, is our own growth curve and what changes and what stays the same and, and how things evolve. And whiskey brings that experience, possibility of experience to you. So Ardbeg definitely comes off as a little bit of iodine on the nose. So again, you're like, iodine on the nose? Why would I want to drink that? Don't start with it. But at some point in time, try it. Huh. You, I get a lot of like sea salt here as well. Mm. So the smoke, there's no mistaking it. It is not subtle. It is in your face. It is wood burning seaside fire with, again, sweet tobacco rolled in and like a savory, almost kind of meat <laughs> that's cooking. And those are weird notes, I know. Um, I am a peat head, so there was going to be peat in my selection here. But I can't say it enough, it's about stepping out of the norm. Using whiskey to step out of the norm and to sometimes even maybe shock yourself. That Log of Woolen 16, the first time I had it, as stated, I, it was off-putting. Yet, I think a year and a half later, I was seeking it out and all things peat. And I was like, how in the heck did that happen? And it, and it lent me... Well, I know how it happened. I finally found some flavors that where I was picking up the sweetness and the nuances and then the memory triggers were coming in and I was like, well, this is good. This is very, very good. So, again, this is my list. I want to tell you a caveat. I haven't watched Scott's, Scott's list at all. It came out a couple weeks ago. It was blowing up. I was like, I'm not going to watch it. I don't want to be influenced. Um, I think I saw some comments where I know, I think, again, I haven't watched the video, but I saw a comment come across where I think he had the Ardbeg tin in there. I'll go watch it after I get this up and post it. Um, uh, but I will say the interesting thing about whiskey is the journey. Um, for me, it's not the consumption. Scott and I have friends that think somehow we're these hardcore drinkers because we drink whiskey. And I, I almost tell him if you were around, I think you might think I was a teetotaler, but with whiskey because I can spend an hour and I like to spend an hour with an ounce, sipping it, breaking it down, watching a movie or a show with my wife, nosing it. Sometimes she'll even complain, I'm doing more nosing than drinking. <laughs> okay, yeah, because it's a full experience, and that is why these are 10 whiskeys you need to try before you die. Scotch it, you Scotch gods. Slaunch it, dummies. Slaunch it, dummies.